Okay, great. So in 1905, there was a young boy who was born in Latvia in Riga. And by 1921, this little boy was a 16-year-old boy with holes in his shoes and a kind of coat that was all ruffled and messed up hair. And he was a 16-year-old boy in the middle of the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution was then four years old. And Latvia was in quite a mess. And this little boy had no family around him to speak of. And he had no money and no education or formal education to speak of. And this little boy was called Oscar. And Oscar had an opportunity either to stay where he was in Latvia and things weren't exactly looking great environmentally and he didn't see much of a future in that environment. So he had a choice either to stay there and to rot or find things very tough or get on a refugee boat and find his future like his brother did when he went to New York. So he got on a refugee boat and he sailed to what he hoped would end up as America and he found the UK and he went to the immigration offices in London and they asked after a month of scrubbing decks with no food and no sustenance for his journey, a really tough journey to England on a boat, Oscar found London and in the immigration offices he asked if he could get into America and he was told to go back on the street. And so Oscar went back on the street after a month of travelling there to try and get into America and he got on another boat and he went to South Africa and he arrived in Cape Town early round about 1922, January, February 1922, and Oscar went round Cape Town looking for a job, couldn't find one. And then he decided with two other Latvian boys, I believe, he went into a Jewish restaurant and was told to try and ask for help in Johannesburg. So he walked a thousand kilometers. This little boy who is now nearly 17 years old walked from Cape Town to Johannesburg about a thousand kilometers to look for a job. Eventually Oscar found work and he was given a little tin shack and a grain blanket to keep warm and for about five or six years he earned the equivalent of about 10 pounds every three months three pounds a month three euros a month for what he did and his only excursion for fun this little 17 year old boy was on a tram that went to another little village and back again that was his fun and he did this for five or six years and managed to collect lots of money together in his terms and he had about 200 euros in his mid-twenties to start a business and Oscar had no skills. He couldn't read, he couldn't write, he had no skills to speak of, no capabilities. He only had himself and 200 pounds but now he had a twinkle in his eye. He had a real personality. Oscar had an amazing zest for life. And this 24, 25 year old boy took these boxes from the back of a cinema in, in Melbourne in Johannesburg. He took some dirty boxes, he cleaned them up, and he started selling them to shops. What Oscar did have was he had an incredible energy, a passion, a persistence, a determination, an incredible belief for life. And he started selling to these, and he had a great personality. People just loved and warmed to Oscar. And so he started selling these boxes, more and more of these boxes. He collected more and more dirty boxes, cleaned them up, sold them to shops to put all their suits in. And Oscar started his little business. Then he bought two wire stitching machines and he got um, a little ma uh, man, a man called Abraham Matudu helped him, he got him a little bicycle and they had these two wire stitching machines and they started making more and more cardboard boxes and Oscar started selling more and more and more cardboard boxes and Abraham, even if it got wet, it was said that Abraham used to drive around with all these boxes and deliver them that Oscar had been selling and Oscar sold, sold more and more and more, he sold more and more. Within a couple of years, Oscar had nine staff, then 25 staff, then 100 staff, then 500 staff. And Oscar built an enormous business called Transvaal Box. And he started buying huge paper rolls bigger than this room in New York, from New York, from a company called St. Regis. And the owners of St. Regis backed Oscar when he had this big business, Transvaal Box, to take over his competitors called Amalgamated Box. And Oscar, this little 16-year-old boy with no education, he was now in his 30s, couldn't read, couldn't write, not one skill in the book, had now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people working for him. And he took over Melvin Packaging and he founded a company called Nanpack that is very much alive today. Nanpack today, I believe, as we're sitting in this room, turns over a billion US dollars a day. This little Oscar that collected some cardboard boxes from the back of the cinema and sold them to shops and just got on with people and used huge energy and persistence and determination and passion and belief and focus and energy, everything that we've heard about today, 
with, couldn't even change a plug, couldn't sign his own name, couldn't read or write, was now chairman of one of the largest distribution and box companies, manufacturing companies in the whole of South Africa. No skills. And Oscar built an enormous business without being able to read or write. And the reason, ladies and gentlemen, why I'm so passionate about that story is Oscar is my grandfather. But the amazing thing, thank you, bless you. So the amazing thing about Oscar, if I can end up as 10th of the man that Oscar was, then I'll be doing okay. What is so incredible for me and many thousands of people I'm very privileged to tell this story to around the world now, what's so amazing about what he called himself this little Oscar, and Oscar had a thousand people at his own wedding. He used to say, look at what this little Oscar has achieved. He came from a hellish environment. Look at what I've achieved. Look at this little Oscar with no skills. And what's so prevalent in this room to me is not our skills, not our environment, not our behaviours that makes us successful. It's our beliefs and our values and who you are when you're at your very best. And much more than that, it's what is your reason to live beyond yourself? And so I believe that for so many years, I've been given the privilege of an awful lot of training where I've been given skills. And I've been told, Craig, if you behave in this way, you're going to be successful. If your behaviours are right, you're going to be successful. And if you have loads and loads and loads of skills, you're going to be successful. And if you have the right environment, Craig, and you create a nice car that everybody can look at, or a nice big house, or a great desk and lovely phones and the right internet and everything else, you're going to be successful. Right environment, right behaviour. Just keep doing the right things, Craig and have loads of skills, you're going to be successful. That is a big part of what makes us successful. But what really makes us successful way, 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 way beyond that is what's most important to you in your lives. I believe is what's most important to you in your lives. And who you are, who's your identity, who are you proud of to be, and much more important than any of that stuff, is what's your reason for living beyond yourself? What can you give? So I'm going to share with you those six different levels. And this was first built, I believe this was first built or put in this structure by a gentleman called Diltz in America, an amazing NLP trainer for those of you who have heard about neuro-linguistic programming. And he developed something called neurological levels of change, which is how we change. So I'm going to ask you guys just for two minutes to do some exercises to share and enjoy this process. And I'm sure it's going to give you an enormous amount of clarity. I've seen so many management structures in my business over the last 15 years. And this to me is the most profound. It's the most powerful because it's simple and it cuts through all the nonsense and gives us a real focus as to what is true for us. So the first level of change is what we call environment. Well, big pen. Okay, so guys, shout out to me. What is environment? Surroundings. Yeah, our surroundings. Exactly right. So they're all big pens. Right, okay, so here, <laughs> so here is our surroundings. So where we live. Okay, so that is what they call the lowest level of change. In other words, how fast can we change our environment? How quick? How quick, guys? Can, yeah, if you want to lose weight, what can you do? Quick. Don't eat something or go to the gym, yeah? You can change your environment fast. Second level is behaviour. What is behaviour? Yeah, the way we act. Absolutely, what we do. Yeah. Above behaviour, so this is a level of change. Can you change your environment, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, can you change your behaviour, yes or no? These are all external to us. We love them and we spend a lot of our time living in this world because we know we can change it fast. And it gets us quick fixes. We can change our environment. People see we're successful because we got a new car. People see we're successful because we got um, changed our body. People see all sorts of stuff about our behaviour. They judge us and we're living in a judgmental society in the Western world where people judge us based on our behaviour and they can see it fast so we work on it. It doesn't go as deep as what I'm about to show you, not nearly as deep. 
Above behavior is capability. What is capability? Our skills. How we do what we do. So this is where we live. This is what we do. This is how we do what we do. How we do it. This is where a huge percentage of training in the Western world lives and where we spend all our money is get more skills, get more skills. Skills are important. All of these three, though, are external. People can see, so we can demonstrate them in a judgmental society. We spend all our time here, or a lot of our time here. This is what changed my life. Above this, the fourth level is belief, beliefs and values. What are beliefs and values? What's, absolutely, why? What's most important to you guys in your life? How you choose to live your life. Absolutely. This is what's most important to us. In other words, our behaviour is what we do. This is about trust, integrity. In other words, if you buy a car from a salesman, if you go in to buy a car and the salesman treats you with contempt and you don't trust him, are you going to buy the car, yes or no? No. This is what sells is what's most important in our life, most important, is live our values. Above that, we have our identity. What's our identity? Who we are. are. Exactly right. Is who we are. And I want to add something to that. Who we are when we're ourselves, when we're authentic. Who we are when we're truly ourselves, when we're at our very best, who are we? Above that, you have the highest level of change of all, which is our purpose. Which is what? What's our purpose? Give me a definition of purpose. Sorry? Yes, what we're here for. What's our reason for living beyond ourselves? This is us. This is I. This is who we are. When you go above us and you want to serve the rest of the world, you have what is your reason for living beyond yourself. Now, I'm interested in two things. I'm fascinated by, was Oscar's environment cracking? Was it a fantastic environment, yes or no? No, it sucked. (laughs) Okay, it sucked. What were Oscar's behaviours? He was just collecting cardboard boxes and talking to people. Anything special about that? Yes or no? How many skills did Oscar have? None. So his environment sucked. His behavior was just cleaning up boxes and selling them. That was his entire business. He used to say nothing complicated about behavior. Just do the normal stuff day by day and just do it, but keep doing it. Capability, I don't have any skills. I know how to talk to people. Yes, you could say that's a skill. But I don't know how to change a plug. I don't know how to read or write. Those three, Oscar didn't focus on. Oscar knew there was a better life for his family, and all he wanted to do was make sure that nobody that he loved had to go through what he's just been through. He wanted to focus on making sure that nobody went through the crap that he'd just been through, the hard life. That was his focus, that was his purpose. And he knew he was a true leader, he was a fighter. He had massive energy. He just trusted. He had great hunger. He just trusted. He had these three in abundance. He didn't have those three. And he ended up as one of the most powerful businessmen in South Africa of his time. So I have three minutes left. And I'd like to share that with you and ask you the question. So just share with somebody next to you. Who are you when you're at your best? And what is your reason for living beyond yourself? What's your reason for being here? What's your reason for doing something extraordinary in your own uniqueness over the next 30 years of your life? Just have a chat to somebody next to you. What's your reason for doing something that you truly deserve to do? Share that. Is it love? Is it passion? Is it to give? What's your reason?
So it, and often we know it without language. So what's our reason for living beyond ourselves is often beyond language. For me, it's to give, and that's why I've started this incredible charity I'm very proud of, and so many people are involved in the charity now. For me, it's about giving and supporting and sharing others. So what's yours? What's your reason for being here? And who are you when you're at your very best? I ask all the learning that I've done in the last 10, 15 years and hearing these great speakers here today, that's what I really want to leave with, is that question is for, you, for me to ask you if you'd be willing to share with yourself over the next seven, eight days these kind of questions. What's most important to you in your life? Who are you when you're at your very best? And what's your reason for living beyond yourself? I'd like to end uh, with the modern day version of a verse uh, that was said by Theodore Roosevelt in the Citizens of the Republic in 1910. And it goes, it's not the critic that counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by blood, sweat and tears, and knows great devotion and the power of achievement. And if he fails, at least he will fail while daring greatly, so that his place will not be with those odd and timid souls that know neither victory nor defeat. You've never lived until you've almost died, and for those who've had to fight for it, life has a flavour the protected shall never know. Thanks, guys. It's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. And um, a great way of ending um, the first TEDx Valletta.